Welcome back guys. Coming up on the end of the year here. So what we're gonna do is look at our weekly breakdown like we usually do. And then we're gonna look at a few key dates that I've picked out going forward. One or two things may change um, going forward, but for the most part, uh, I've got the rest of the semester mapped out. So I'll give you guys an idea of how it's gonna go. So just uh, this week, Monday, Tuesday are gonna be notes. Uh, the topic on Monday will be part of your unit three review. The reading on Tuesday is more just for you guys, like little life stuff to know when you go on and do groceries on your own. So uh, there will be a question on your exam that relates to that. It's not gonna be a long answer or anything. It'll be a two or three point short answer where you use one or two or three of these tips uh, to describe something. So <clears throat> for the most part, you probably picked up on a handful of these just throughout the semester through the marketplace documentaries, through our notes but it's just kind of putting them all into one thing. And it's also a handy little thing, you know, uh, when you go off to university, you can print out that list, make sure you're doing those handful of things. Nobody likes spending money on food, right? You, you think of it, if you save a dollar a day on a product over the year, you save 365. So for example, me going to Tim Hortons every day, as opposed to going to Starbucks for one coffee a day, probably saves me about $2 a day, right? So if I was, and I'd rather spend those hundreds of dollars other places, right? So saving your money and paying attention to these things can definitely benefit you and put your money where you'd rather spend it, which is not on food, right? <clears throat> Wednesday will be a regular discussion day. I'll again put that topic out probably around Tuesday. And then uh, Thursday and Friday are your designated review periods. So that leads into the next key date on May 5th. So next Tuesday following this week, you will have your unit three test. So that's on all health and safety topics we've mentioned, excluding the grocery tips. Like I just said, there'll only be one exam question on that. Uh, then let's look ahead here. So May 6th will be your last discussion. So uh, if we're looking at it, this would be one, two, three. We essentially have four weeks of school left at this point. So that's week one. We'll be finishing up week two, or sorry, unit three throughout week two. Week three will be your review week, so that's from May 11th to May 15th. And then the 18th to the 22nd is your exams. So for this week, uh, or sorry, for May 6th, that's your last discussion. We won't have a discussion during the review or exam weeks, just to obviously prioritize exams and final projects. Your final project, I'm going to try and have it out for May 4th, but it may only come out after your Unit 3 test is done. Just, uh, again, it depends on how on top of things I am, but uh, I'll try to come up with it as soon as possible, just so you guys can have everything laid out for the rest of the year. That, between all your courses, you can now pick and choose what you need to be on top of. So that's pretty much the, uh, the breakdown, just a little bit on the review week. So I'll review unit one, because that was our largest unit. That'll be a Monday, Tuesday review. I'll put out some more YouTube videos that are just specific to those units. I'll put up our old Cahoots review packages and exam review package. You'll have plenty of resources. Then the Wednesday, Thursday would be the unit two review. Uh, the stuff we kind of did online and half did in person. And then unit three would be on the Friday where it's just refreshing some of the key points from the unit, maybe taking up your test. We'll probably take it up to before then. So that's just looking ahead at the next month. I, again, I'll start to put some of these dates on your calendar just so you can start to look ahead, know what you have to do, prepare, and uh, yeah. So that's your weekly and monthly kind of breakdown for now. Uh, we're gonna look at Monday's note now. We're gonna be looking at your food sciences note. So your learning goals, I can explain how the Atwater system replaced the bomb calorimeter. So we'll talk about that in a second. I can explain how protein, fat, and carb contents are calculated. So we'll talk about that also in a minute here. But you don't have to go to the uh, exact scientific level with that one. Just have a brief explanation for the process. And I can list the four things that are tested to when it comes for, to health and safety in a food product. So key terms, this is going to be a review for a bit of it. So calorie, enough energy to raise one gram of water by one degree Celsius. Calorimetry, so the study of measuring how much heat or energy something gives off or can produce. And the calorimeter is the apparatus in which you use to perform calorimetry and measure whatever uh, 
fuel source you're recording. So that's where we're going to talk about a bomb calorimeter. Oh, sorry, last note. The bomb calorimeter is what you would have used previously. Uh, it's an outdated method uh, to measure total caloric content. So food science, a pretty general definition there. So food science is applied to a wide variety across the production, health and safety, um, the actual nutritional content of food. So in general, it is what you think it is. And then food engineering. So a lot of people think food engineering is the modification of the genes of the food or the animal. Um, it also includes the engineering revolved around the machines that they use, the distribution methods that they use, the packaging, the ingredient analysis. So it encompasses a lot more than what people generally think. So next one. So on the previous one. So uh, this is just kind of explaining the bomb calorimeter. So in a general sense, what you would do is you'd put the food product in, ignite it, and then you'd measure the total uh, difference in heat. So the food is ignited. As it starts to burn, all the chemical bonds in it are broken, giving off energy. That raises the temperature of the water. Again, one calorie, one degree raise. And then they just monitor the rise in temperature through a, th a thermostat. So just looking at what it actually looks like. So again, product goes in here, water heats up, they observe it, and then they just perform some calculations. Obviously, if it went up 20 degrees, 20 calories. So we're gonna talk about a flaw with this method. So I'm just gonna be kind of checking here. My memory's a little short, so I get getting cut off. So if you, sorry about that. So uh, this ended up being replaced by the Atwater system. So we've talked about the results of the Atwater system or the variables, which are listed there. So one gram of fat is equal to nine calories. One gram of either protein or carbohydrates will give you four calories. And then a gram of alcohol is worth seven calories. So how Atwater did it was he determined the average that most people would retain from uh, each source. So it isn't actually an exact science that every person will retain nine calories or this person's going to get four. But again, those averages were based off of a lot of trials. Now, measuring the macros got a little more scientific. So we'll start with protein. So protein is measured by the presence of nitrogen in the substance. So when we talked about protein structure, we mentioned the amine group which involves nitrogen. There's also some nitrogen in the R chains uh, amongst those amino acids. So determining how much um, you know, uh, nitrogen is present is going to indicate how much grams of protein are in that substance. Fats, so they are tested by using soluble versus insoluble methods. So what they're going to do is they're going to take the product, uh, assess it, and run a bunch of tests to determine A, how much soluble fat is there, how much insoluble is there as well. That's also going to tie into uh, vitamins and minerals. We'll talk about vitamins in a second. So then after you've determined the protein and fats, if you know the total caloric value of something from the bomb calorimeter, then you know um, the fats and protein, you're left with the carbohydrates. Now you have to do an analysis to determine how much fiber would be present because that was a flaw with the bomb calorimeter. So I kind of skimmed through that. So for why bomb calorimeters needed more science behind them, if you think of fiber, we're not going to metabolize it. So we won't actually get those cal calories that were recorded when you ignited the substance on fire, right? It measured the caloric change because there was, let's say, two grams of fiber there. That added eight calories. But in reality, our body can't process that, so we would be short those eight calories. Next up. Next up. Okay, we're still going. Uh, uh, lastly, testing for some safety variables. So these are things that um, shouldn't be in the product and this can lead to food fraud or um, just health and safety issues if you didn't manage either the production, distribution, storage or whatever of the food rate. 
So allergens, so not only does the food need to be made without allergens, it needs to be delivered to the consumer every step of the way without coming in contact with allergens. We talked about the different ends of uh, allergic reactions, right? Someone might be, who is mildly allergic, may not react the same as someone who has uh, severe allergies. So you need to account more so for the severe person, right? If they're gonna be okay, everybody down will also be okay. You want to kind of prepare for the worst. Uh, bacteria and microorganisms, we've talked about protecting those. So if they determine that something was present, that might give them an idea of how it was improperly stored, what bacteria developed, how much of it, kind of a time thing, right? How much uh, bacteria is built up is an indication of how exposed it is. Fillers and cleaning chemicals. So fillers is more towards food fraud. So if you're saying that you know something is 100% chicken and you know they've slapped protein powder in there, that claim becomes false, right? Because it's not 100% pure. We've also mentioned how they can uh, kind of what's the word I'm looking for? Find loopholes in those guidelines so that they can put their product out and make those claims. And then cleaning chemicals. So this would just be again the same thing as there's something that got into the product that shouldn't have been. Typically. Um, it doesn't happen. Usually people clean and keep the chemicals safe, uh, sorry, keep them stored away from whatever you're uh, serving. But sometimes that does happen, right? If you use a chemical cleaner, let's say bleach or something to wipe something down, and then it just spills or something and it's not treated properly, it can come into contact with other stuff. Or even, you know, uh, just sanitizing things nowadays. Sanitizers you don't want on your food. So that's what they're testing for there. Again, that might be if, you know, a food has been determined to have been unsafe, they'll analyze the food, what was wrong with it, might be part of a lawsuit potentially, uh, you know, scientific proof that this food had this, this, and this in it, that led to this person being sick. Today, guys, is take up your unit, or sorry, the, uh, the worksheet you guys did the other day with some of the key terms and examples. So I'm actually just going to skip... Uh, these first four here, I don't think anybody got those ones wrong. Pretty general definitions. I think we might have even done a couple of them at the beginning of the unit. Uh, food poisoning, so the result of improper preparation, storage, or handling of a food. Uh, an example would be salmonella to cook. Uh, you didn't cook the food properly or thoroughly. Cross-contamination, so this is when one uh, form of bacteria or pathogen can get onto another. So an example of this would be when you have uh, designated cutting boards in a kitchen. So you might have something for poultry, you might have something for fish, and then you might have something to cut for vegetables. Well, if you move, uh, so let's say you put chicken onto the veggie tray to cut it, that's cross-contamination, right? You've mixed up things that should have been separate in terms of preparation. Sanitize to make something clean. So there's a couple different parts to that, right? There's the initial cleaning with soap and water, the rinsing, and then the sanitizing. So the sanitizing is actually making sure there's also not that harsh chemical cleaner. It's stripped away. Anaphylaxis and allergen and auto injector. I'll kind of go through those three together. So we mentioned the varying degrees that you can have of allergies. So if you have severe allergies and you're extremely allergic to something, you'll go into what's called anaphylactic shock or anaphylaxis, meaning your throat's gonna swell up, you can't breathe. That's when the auto injector comes in. What it is, is it contains norepinephrine or adrenaline. You inject it into the thigh, opens up their system. Fortified and nutraceutical, so fortified first, that is any product that has had micronutrients added to it for health benefits. So commonly you see this with cereals where it's just a bunch of sugar, but they throw some vitamins into it. You can also see it with, um, um, what's the one, it's vitamin waters. So they have some sugar in there and then they just uh, throw a lot of vitamins in there. And then a nutraceutical, so is essentially um, a health supplement or anything that doesn't have caloric value, but is believed to have health benefits. So that, again, you can break pretty much anything that doesn't give you calories for GNC for that one. So you guys got those key terms down pretty well. So what I'm going to do now is just quickly skim through uh, that groceries note, and then that'll be it for this week's lesson. 
So again, title is being food literate. So as we determined, this isn't just making economic or health related decisions. It also benefits the environment. It benefits a ton of other things, right? It's a trickle down effect. So I can describe the importance effects of a certain food related to decisions on the environment. So again, that's being food literate. And I understand food literacy means more than just the health effects of the product. So I just kind of reviewed that. So I think I've mentioned some of these. You guys might not have a hard time seeing them from this way. So make a list before you go grocery shopping. So usually what I like to do is think, what am I gonna eat breakfast, uh, lunch, dinner that week, and then anything I want in between. That way you kind of go in, you're in and out pretty quick. Especially like times like now where you don't want to be in the grocery store as long as possible. Personally, I never liked spending a lot of time there. I want to be pretty in and out. So that's pretty much my number one tip. Another good tip, don't go on an empty stomach because then everything looks a lot more appealing. You walk into a place like Costco, you're obviously going to get uh, some samples and then ultimately you might just be hungry and think, wow, that product's really good. It's more satisfying, but then you eat it later and it wasn't as good because you're not as hungry. Buy local when possible. So obviously when it comes to certain materials, we can't grow them here. So you have to get the ex uh, exported ones. But if possible, get the local stuff. It's typically fresher and healthier. Now, some frozen food does retain its nutrients very well, but usually you can't go wrong with fresh. Stick to the outside. This is typically where the healthier foods are. So a lot of grocery stores and uh, even just, you know, a place like Walmart where it's part grocery, part something else, they try and wind you through so that you go through the expensive stuff or the... Uh, the stuff you wouldn't necessarily need, not the essentials and non-essentials. So just kind of a little trick, don't completely avoid the frozen section. So like I just mentioned, so uh, frozen veggies and frozen fruits sometimes retain their nutrients better than fresh ones. Again, it's all situational, but that is, uh, there is potential for that in science to back it up. Buy in bulk. So uh, if you buy anything, you're cutting down on two costs essentially. If you are a business, you're cutting down your distribution fee on that. And just as a person, if you buy in bulk, now you're paying for less packaging, right? If you buy something in a ton of little tiny units as opposed to a big uh, one sum of it, you're probably getting more packaging in that little, little bunch of units, right? It's kind of a deceptive trick. You think, you know, it might be less packaging than that one big thing, but all those little things add up. So cardboard is typically better in that situation too. It's uh, more easily recyclable. Uh, always use your reusable bags, so make sure you leave them in your car. Uh, that's usually the best method to do it. That way you don't forget, so after you bring them in, we'll throw the bags back in the car. Uh, a big thing with these though that can lead to problems is people don't wash them. So if you don't wash your bags, there was actually a study performed, I think it was uh, like two or three years ago, and it's in our textbook, but uh, essentially they went to a Walmart and determined that about 70, I want to say the number was, 70% of the reusable bags had E. coli because no one actually rewashed them. So, little flaw with them. Keep the recycling bin in the kitchen. Same thing with the garbage, right? You're obviously keeping the garbage close by, but if you put the recycling bin, you know, somewhere that's a little bit farther, sometimes some items that might go in, or should go into the recycling end up in the garbage just from convenience or laziness. Same with the compost bin, great idea. Picking out eco-friendly packaging. So we watched a video it on the other day. There's actually stores that only use this. So try and pick cardboard over plastic when possible. If you can bring your own stuff, like little containers, bags, stuff, instead of using the packaging, you'll probably save some money and you're doing good for the environment. And then try to eliminate waste. So just that's kind of a summative process, right? Doing all of these little things will over time add up to you saving a bunch of waste. Reusable materials. Uh, reusable materials, so not too many on this, like if you go and drink out coffees every day or something like that where you're constantly replacing it, get a reusable mug, stuff like that. 
increase the quantity. Now, this is probably the biggest uh, deception that the grocery stores or brands more than the grocery stores pull is deceiving you into thinking that one amount is bigger than the other. Uh, one example that just kind of sticks out because I did groceries recently is cottage cheese. So you can either get two little tubs, which are each 400 grams, and they have, or sorry, 250 for 400 grams, so you end up paying five bucks for 800 grams, or for five bucks you can get the big tall thing that has 750. So it's a kind of a reverse example, right? You think, oh, if I get the really big one, I'm getting more than the two little ones. It's five bucks, it's the price of them, but you're not actually getting as much in that. Now, in that, admittedly, I would be using more packaging that's necessary. Uh, one thing too on that, some grocery stores on their labels will now say the price and then the price for 100 grams, so that way you can measure between a couple different brands. And then I just want you guys to skim through this handout. It's got a couple of uh, different ones, but ultimately if that's your note and lessons for this week, guys, we're done unit three, so I'll send out around either Tuesday or Wednesday, I'll send out that unit three review package and then you can get right on it. I'll talk to you guys next week.